Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0! This is just a quick touch-in before we get into some other things with our uh, Pluto-1 mission, which uh, I have renamed. Uh, da -da -da, renamed Vessel, yes, this is Tomba's Ambassador, uh, in honor of the man who discovered, quote, discovered Pluto. And uh, it has uh, made its entry into Jupiter SOI, as you can see by this creative blue line here. And I, I, I recorded like 20 minutes of me tugging at nodes and messing with things before I realized that uh, I forgot to press record. So uh, I have set up two more maneuver nodes after we... Come on. No, not Neptune. How about Pluto? Can I get Pluto? There we go. Focus view. So... Our current trajectory is now the solid line. I made about a 0.3 meter per second correction. Uh, we're going to make another correction in about five years. That's going to bring us onto this dotted line. And this maneuver, I'm not sure how much delta V it's going to take. It's probably way outside of our budget. But um, I just wanted to have something on cue so I'd know what an orbit of Pluto would look like. So, um, Tom Ball's ambassador, formerly Pluto-1, is on a solid trajectory and we'll get here in uh yeah about 4877 days but uh it's going to do a wake up protocol in about five years to make one further correction to put it on a much more direct course for pluto which is really awesome that this mission is just going so gosh darn well so anyway we're gonna get down to some other stuff and i'll pick you guys up in just a few All right, well, as uh, soon as the PC catches up with me. There we go, close, KJR stabilizing load, there it is! Uh, I think this looks considerably better than previous versions. So, uh, SAS is on, throttle is set to full, ignition sequence start, that is a lot of engines. And we are lit. And clear the clamps. All right, the uh, first hurdle has been passed. You can hear our RS-25s finally coming fully to light there, but uh, we are off and running at a 1.5 liftoff thrust to weight ratio. That is very respectable. Uh, the six F1s were giving you something like a 1.04, which made for kind of a crawl off the pad. Although they did have longer runtime, they were not delivering these numbers as far as Delta V is concerned. So we're gonna have to just, uh, see how this whole thing works. Um, you know, fingers crossed and stuff. I don't have a whole else, lot going else, a whole lot else going on in the space program. And why did the tone change? Did we lose a bunch of engines? Nope, looks like everything is still up and running. That's very good to hear. I should start my gravity turn. A little bit of wobbles. I'm hoping it's just that uh, 100 ton weight being not actually attached to the fairing. I never bothered to go back and fix that. I'm sure it would have just been a matter of right-clicking on the fairing and it just kind of suddenly readjusts itself. But we need to be leaning into this gravity turn. We're going to have good thrust-to-weight ratios the whole way through this. You see, after stage set, we'll be down to only 1.4, which is fantastic. Now, uh, this thrust-to-weight ratio probably shouldn't change because we are fueling the core booster off our intermediate stage, and actually, yeah, I meant to uh, and open these fuel types while we were going. Am I burning off of that booster? No, I am not. Okay, looking good. Oh yeah, we need to be leaning into this a lot more than we are. A little bit of kickback wiggles, but nothing I don't think I can handle. 14 seconds left to stage set. I'd like to see all these numbers hit zero at the same time. Liquid hydrogen is feeding both the E1s and our cluster of RS-25s, which is fine. Uh, I think I got the timing synchronized on all of that. I really hope I did. we'll find out. Oh man, shock effects, that's new. 
so far everything's uh, looking green. Let's uh, hope this little guy, little guy, that's, that's hilarious. This is easily the largest thing I've ever built. Anyway, let's, uh, let's hope this thing pulls its weight all the way to orbit. And there's first booster set. They are clear and away. Uh, well, all right. I, I guess we're a little low in the atmosphere still. <laughs> so them changing direction so suddenly, not surprising aerodynamic stresses would claim them. Now we're just going to lean into it the best. Um, all right. Well, if you're a little confused by all of this, uh, don't worry, it's not your fault. I actually recorded about an hour's worth of footage of me um, building this out and explaining what I was doing, or at least uh, intending to explain what I was doing while I was building it in sped up footage, as I am prone to do, and I uh, got all the way through it and got out to the launch pad before I realized OBS is just recording a bunch of, uh, like, screen but good audio, and I figured that's probably not the greatest thing in the world to watch here on the YouTubes, so I, I'm just going to do a brief explanation of things in post, but uh, old me is going to chime in here in a second with uh, relevant information, so I'll turn you back over to him for just a second. Whoa. Alright, well we had one booster cut out before the others, that's interesting definitely something worth noting. Very odd. Very odd indeed. Right, well, now that he's done with that. Uh, initially, I built this with six F1 boosters, but was getting rather marginal results. And again, I'm going to chime in. It seems that weight gets higher and higher every time. Yes, yes it does. Uh, it's way removed from the fairing, but now that I've got an actual gap in time with uh, some sped up footage, uh, I built a version of this that looked pretty much identical. It just had six F1s. Uh, I went back and replaced those six F1s with uh, seven uh, E1 engines that fit the exact same footprint. You'll notice those boosters are about 5.6 meters in diameter. Uh, and I was getting much, much better uh, thrust to weight and delta V numbers from all of that. Now, the cross-feeding was just kind of an idea I had, since the boosters were could be so incredibly tall. Why not pack them with a little liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, to feed the core stage while the boosters cross-feed each other? It was just a matter of getting the amount of fuels synchronized, because uh, they will draw, the core stage will draw liquid oxygen from the boosters, that's intended for the Carolox engines, even though it's not. So you have to get the timing just right to where all the fuels for all the engines and the boosters run out at the same time in order to prevent there being a offset in the mixture when you're down to just the core stage, which is why that whole building process took as long as it did. And I'm really kind of mad that I don't have the footage to show to you because uh, there was a lot of me just tinkering with things. Anyway, we are coming up on our orbital mark now, so I will turn you back over to old me, who will uh, carry us through the rest of the episode. And manual engine shutdown with uh, four seconds left to burn at 295 by 182 kilometer. Uh, I'd call that a success. Go ahead and stage off our core. And uh, this is our new transfer stage. It is a little smaller, a little less capable than the uh, previous version, but I think it looks a whole lot better. Uh, just a personal preference, really. And we'll uh, wait for Kerbals to... Please don't crash. Please don't crash. I think the game crashed. Yeah, I think we lost it. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I figured out what I needed to figure out, and that is that this launch vehicle will work. This uh, total tonnage on this thing here is probably just under 500 tons. I was going to pull up MechJev and check, but uh, I had, yeah, of course, yep, there's my spinny wheel. The game has crashed. Bummer. Well, that looks like a good enough place to leave this, so uh, that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out. I do appreciate it, and I will see all of you in the next one. So until then. See you later. Oh, did you look at that? It
as soon as I stopped the recording, it started working again. So I think this is uh, OBS just giving me some troubles, which would not be unheard of. And the dog is sitting right next to me. <laughs> if it's not one thing, it's another, I guarantee you. All right, I just wanted to see uh, how well this thing can actually maneuver. Not very well, turns out. But, you know, that's fine when you're cranking around 490-some-odd tons. Actually, vessel info, right? Vessel mass, 471 tons. Uh, so it's a, a little shy of my 500 mark, but we certainly do have enough Delta V to send 100 tons to Mars, and uh, that was always the goal. So uh, it may not be quite 500 tons to uh, low Earth orbit, although I imagine before we staged off our core, we were probably well over 500 tons. I think that empty mass on that has to be greater than 30 tons. I'm, I'm not 100%. Don't hold me to it. Actually, can we switch? Yeah. Oh, vessel mass, 99 tons. So we just sent 570 tons to, er to orbit. That's awesome. Sweet. Okay, for real this time, that is going to do it for this episode, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging out. I do appreciate it, and I will see all of you in the next one. So until then, see you later.